All right, take it away, Meredith. All right, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Meredith, my pronouns are she, her. I'm an associate teaching professor in the Women's and Gender Studies program at Northern Arizona University. I'm up here in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, and I also teach for our queer studies minor. So sometimes I do public programs on topics that I teach in my classes. And I actually specialize in gender bending and drag. It's what my book is on. So has anybody here seen a drag show or watched drag on TV? Feel free to drop it in the chat. Do you know of any drag performers or clubs? Uh, do you have some experience, any experience with drag? All of the, well, two, two out of three. <laughs> I watch drag. You watch drag? Like, do you watch it on TV, RuPaul's Drag Race, or you go in person to drag shows? I would if I knew where they were. Yeah, okay. Um, somebody says, um, you've watched RuPaul's Drag Race. Anybody else? I watch RuPaul regularly. Yeah. And for a while, I watch it with my adult children in different parts of the country, and we zoom afterwards and talk about it. So we have some experience with uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, kind of know what drag is generally. Okay. My friend Thank just came in as a runner up in the Boston Drag Gauntlet, so. Who did? Uh, my friend who does drag just came in as runner up in the Boston Drag Gauntlet. Awesome. Hey. So June is Pride Month. Um, and in honor of this month, I'd like to talk to you uh, today a little bit about um, the queer studies topic of drag. Um, I want to talk a little bit about its origins, its current forms, and then why this performance is so strongly connected to the LGBTQ community. And at the end, uh, there'll be time for like discussion and questions. So if you have anything burning in your head, write it down, and there'll be a big space at the end for that. So before I get into the history of drag, um, I'd like to go over some of the terms that I'm gonna be using today. So you might be familiar with the acronym LGBT or LGBTQ or maybe LGBTQI uh, plus, or maybe if you are um, in a location like I am that's close to a lot of uh, tribal nations and reservations, you might see the 2S, which stands for two spirit, it's an indigenous identity. Or instead of that acronym, you might just hear or see people use the term queer. And queer can be a stand-in for any of the letters. It's an umbrella. So it actually could be any letter or it could include all the letters. And the good of that umbrella is that it's totally inclusive and it's way easier to say than the acronym. The bad of substituting queer for the acronym is that it lacks specificity and sometimes it can uh, be used as a slur, right? Historically though, if we look at the etymology or the origins of uh, the Western origins of the term queer, historically it was used as an adjective for things that were weird or out of sync or didn't make sense. People would be like, that's queer, like that's weird. And if you live in a society where you think it's normal to be heterosexual, it makes sense that homosexual people started to be called queer, right? But actually, I think that that origin is very useful for defining many things that don't fit into or even confront social norms. So I really like the term queer because I think it is a really good tool for like generally looking at things that don't fit into norms. Next, I wanna talk about how drag is a form of theater performance. And that's different than people like living their everyday lives and being their most authentic selves. So, um, a theatrical performance is always one, an expression of something that you are not. So it's not you just like living your everyday life. It's not even you just being out and about in public. Theater is when you perform something you're not. And I think a really good example of this is like, you know, the TV show Seinfeld, like Jerry Seinfeld. So that TV show and that character has his same name, uh, lives in the same area, same job, but he is not just being himself on TV, he's performing a character, right? So theater is always performing some type of character that is quintessentially something that you are not. And then the second thing is uh, theater is public and it's done for others. So we like to say it takes two to make theater, you need one doing it and then one receiving it. 
So again, different than you just like living your life and going to the grocery store or whatever, being in public, theater is I am doing something specifically to communicate something to you for you to receive something. Um, the third thing I want to talk about is how uh, we defined drag. Drag is actually an act of identity bending. So um, sometimes when we say drag, we envision like a man playing a woman or maybe a woman playing a man. Um, a, lot of we, a lot of us know RuPaul, right? That's the type of drag that RuPaul does. And that's certainly a form of drag. And it's certainly a legitimate form um, of drag. But drag also includes many forms of identity bending and identity play. So some are really subtle, some are really shocking, some are really different than the performers live reality, some are not that different, right? So to identify drag, what I like to do is I really like to take it back to that old timey definition of queer, right? I look at a, a performance and I say, is this performance expressing something that's out of sync with or intended to mess with our concept of what's normal in terms of identity. And then the last thing that I will say is, where did the term drag come from? What's the etymology of the term drag? If you Google, where did drag come from, the term drag, um, sometimes you will find a narrative that says um, it came from like long skirts dragging on the ground or dragging on a stage. Sometimes um, searches will say it's an acronym for dressed as a girl. We actually don't have any evidence for any of these stories. So we don't know if they're true and we can't prove that they're true. So actually we don't know where the term drag came from. Like we just don't have that evidence, but we do have some evidence for where the performance practice came from. So even though we don't know about the term, we, we do know about the act itself and scholars um, will trace the origins of drag two ways. The first thing that they do is they will look at the history of cross casting. And then the second thing that they do is look at the history of queer cultural expression. So I'm gonna go through all of those and go through some of the history associated with both forms. So cross casting, what is that? Cross casting is when a character in a story or play is performed by an actor of a different gender. So you write a play or you have a story and you have a woman character and a man actor plays that woman character. Um, we have a lot of records of cross casting because play scripts were written down and also theater was very popular and it was oftentimes state supported. So a lot of those records um, were preserved. Right, so we do have a lot of evidence of that. Now, the maybe the most well-known historical example of cross-casting comes from ancient Greece um, and uh, play festivals that were put on in ancient Greece um, in the fifth, the sixth, and the fifth century BCE. So, um, if you went to see a play festival, um, all plays were performed by three. Um, actors and all of those actors played all of the characters. So a lot of multiple casting and they would play the gods, they would play the peasants, they would play um, the kings, they would play the chorus and they would play women, right? So you have three men actors. And the reason they were men actors is because women were not allowed to publicly act. And we're not sure, but we think women maybe weren't even allowed to go to the play festival. So men had to play women roles because women couldn't play women roles because women were not allowed to participate in theater. Um, and uh, the picture here on the left is, um, you might know the comedy and tragedy masks. Those stem from the historical Greek practice of wearing mask, a mask on your face. And so the mask you see on the left is like a woman mask. So an actor's playing a woman, he puts on the woman mask. So that's ancient Greek theater, probably tied for the um, most well-known historical example is um, that cross-casting was done in Elizabethan Renaissance and Restoration Europe. So, boys or maybe young men, we're not quite sure, would play uh, the women roles. Same reason, women weren't allowed to be public actors. So it's like, the show must go on. We have like a play with women and men. Um, and so men have to play the women. They actually made a movie about this. The movie was Shakespeare in Love, right? Um, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow was not allowed to act. Men are acting the women's roles. Okay. Um, 
actually casting men in women parts because of gender restrictions, performance-based uh, gender restrictions is a cross-cultural historical phenomenon. It didn't just happen in the West. So if we look at Japanese kabuki, the history of Japanese kabuki, it originated around the 1600s CE and originally it was an all women's troupe. And then it was, no, um, it was uh, known for like being um, uh, sexually inappropriate. And so the shogunate at the time was like, okay, to fix this, we're just gonna have all men play all the parts and young boys called wakashu are gonna play the women's parts and then men will play the men's parts. And then everybody was like, that's still too sexy, which is creepy, I know. And then they said, um, okay, we're gonna have adult men play the women's parts and those adult men are gonna be called anagata. Um, a similar um, in Chinese Beijing opera happening around um, the same time. Oops, sorry, let me go back. Happening around uh, the same time, uh, men would play all the women roles because women were not allowed to be public actors. So these stylized women's roles were called uh, Dan or maybe the actress were called Dan. Um, and even after women were allowed to be public actors, hundreds and hundreds of years later, women were allowed to be in um, Beijing opera. It was preferred that men would continue to play these Dan roles because it was seen as um, instead of just realism, like women could only act as themselves, like realistically, that these men actors were acting in this like very heightened, stylized, beautiful, ideal ways. So the tradition continued. So the image on the right is probably the most famous Beijing opera Dan actor, uh, Mei Ling Fang. So all of the examples I gave to you before were examples of cross-casting due to gender prohibitions. Um, but in the 1800s, cross-casting was sometimes done for reasons beyond just gender restrictions. So um, there was a phenomenon in the West in the 1800s where very famous established actors, women actors like Sarah Bernhard would perform what were called trousers roles. And that's when um, they would take on the classics to show their acting skills. So the picture all the way on the left is Sarah Bernhard performing as um, Hamlet, right? In the Shakespearean play. Um, pantomime, the entertainment genre of pantomime was also very popular in the UK. And women would call, uh, perform uh, principal boy roles and principal boy roles were younger boy roles. So there was this idea that women looked more like younger boys. And so women would play younger boy roles. And uh, we can see the legacy of this. This is actually where we get the, um, the practice of having Peter Pan played by a woman because that was originally like a pantomime play. Also in pantomime, um, there would be like this ugly, gross, old lady woman character. And uh, that would oftentimes be played by a man. And that was called a dame character. So in the middle, you have a picture of um, a woman playing principal uh, boy. And then on the left, you have very famous um, actor Dan Lena, Leno playing um, a pantomime dame. So today, cross-casting is a tool that directors and playwrights can use to create a very noticeable difference between the character and the actor. So one of the most famous examples of this is Carol Churchill's play Cloud Nine. There's a character, there's a Victorian character named Betty, and she is very traditional. She wears a lot of traditional clothes. She says a lot of traditional things. And in the script, it is required that Betty be cast with a man actor. And the reason is because um, it is uh, startling and shocking to see those types of Victorian sentiments come out of a body that is re readably a man. The other image, the image here on the left um, is from a contemporary version of Henry V. And this is kind of similar to the play Hamilton where you are casting a person of a different gender or race. And this allows not only more opportunity for more people, but also it adds another layer of meaning about whose stories are most often being told or whose stories are considered classics. Right? So if we go back a little bit, we were in present day, we just go skip back a little bit uh, to the 1800s. Um, another type of gender bending that became very popular um, around that 1800s time period is what's called impersonation. So cross-casting relies on a script or a plot line. You have a story and you have a character. 
impersonation is centered around the novelty of an actor performing a gender that's different than their own. So it's not about the larger story. It's really about this actor who has the skill at performing something that they don't live as in an everyday life. And then on the side, so that's what you come for, that novelty. And then on the side, they will do something like they'll sing or they'll dance. Sometimes they'll tell jokes, stuff like that. So female impersonation was very common in Euro entertainment uh, genres like variety, vaudeville, music hall, that's like the British version, circus and minstrelsy. And, and female impersonation was mainly men performing women's stereotypes. So sometimes men would pre present a feminine illusion, but it was more popular to present this exaggerated or grotesque caricature. And these character caricatures were called dames, aunties, or wenches. Now, um, minstrelsy is where we get the history of blackface performance. And so you can see on the left, uh, Roland Howard is performing a wench character. So he is enacting this caricature of women and he is doing it in blackface. So that was like a common thing in minstrelsy. Um, female impersonators could also work in cross-casted scripted parts. I talked a little bit before about um, the dame in pantomime, but the act of female impersonation was very versatile and it could be performed with or without a story or script. Um, so a very famous female impersonator is the one in the middle there, Julian Eltinch. Um, who was really good at um, these kinds of like grotesque dame or anti types of characters. Um, female impersonation was also cross-cultural. So um, again, it's not just being done in the West. Um, in Ghana, uh, there is an entertainment genre called the, con the concert party theater. And concert party theater included a stock character called the lady. And the lady was an upper class white woman and she was played for laughs uh, by a man actor. So we can see the legacy of impersonation today in scenarios where men actors will play over the top or gross women caricatures specifically for laughs. This is when we are kind of laughing at the ridiculousness of this. So we have our Mrs. Doubtfire, we have our Medea, we have our Flip Wilson as Geraldine Jones. And the joke of these performances, why they're entertaining and charming, is um, that a man is playing all these stereotypes associated with women and it's gross. So it's gross when he does it, that's what's funny about it. So jumping back again, uh, in the 1850s, another form of gender bending became super popular and that is male impersonation. And male impersonation is when a woman performed as a man. And male impersonation was very popular in the US genres of variety and vaudeville. It was not done so much as cross-casting in scripted theater. I said female impersonation was like pretty versatile. Male impersonation, not so much. You do have um, principal boys, which are women playing at these young, as these young men. That was different than male impersonation. Male impersonators played like these adult body kind of blue guys. Um, the most popular caricatures for male impersonators to play were what was called a dandy, a fop, or a swell, which is kind of like this um, rich guy who was like really into booze and liked to go out and party and stuff like that. In variety, um, which was the earlier genre, the variety was um, 1850s to like 1880s, 1890s. Um, in variety, um, Male impersonation was done as a convincing illusion. So the foremost male impersonator um, in variety is Annie Hindle. Annie Hindle is uh, the picture here on the left. And you can see that um, she is looking very masculine. The point was to pass so much that audiences knew because they came to see you, but they couldn't see anything um, except a man in front of them. Vaudeville replaced variety. So vaudeville started to become very popular in the 1880s, 1890s, and it remained pretty popular until around the 1930s. It tried to transition to cinema, but it kind of died down when cinema became very popular. So in turn of the century vaudeville, male impersonations become a lot more androgynous. So on the right, you can see the pic a picture of Vesta Tilly, who was really the premier male impersonator. And you can see you know, a lot more hourglass. Um, uh, she looks a lot younger. So she looks a lot more androgynous than Andy Hindle. 
And this androgynous look was seen as a better fit with the family friendly vibe. Like variety was really body and blue. Vaudeville was seen as a place where you could like take your family, like your kids and stuff. Um, and androgyny was seen as a better fit for vaudeville because this androgynous look avoided looking too quote unquote mannish. And around the 1880s, 1890s, the concept of the mannish woman was becoming popularized as a sign of sexual deviance. So male impersonators actually altered their acts um, to avoid any implications that it wasn't just an act for money. And we can see the legacy of this androgynous look in uh, troops like Japan's Takarazuka Review. If you're in Japan, if you're in Takarazuka, uh, you can go see one of these plays today. Women uh, play all the characters um, in these plays and women play men characters in these androgynous ways. You can see a couple pictures of like how the, the masculinity is done in more, more androgynous ways. And this is desired, it's popular specifically because it's seen as presenting a non-sexually threatening ideal male fantasy, right? So we can see the legacy of that type of thinking and that kind of uh, male impersonation um, today. So very quickly to wrap up cross-casting, we can kind of see how impersonation and cross-casting traditions could maybe represent the origins of modern drag because you have somebody playing it being another gender for entertainment or for laughs or because of gender rules, right? And while the history of cross-casting is really interesting, or I mean, I think it's really interesting, I don't know if you agree, um, I'm a little bit of a theater nerd, um, other scholars trace drag origins differently. Instead of looking at cross-casting, they look at performance traditions in queer cultural spaces. So this history is way harder to trace because it wasn't as public and it wasn't as state sanctioned and those records could put people in peril and jeopardy. So a lot of times people did not keep those records. We have way fewer records of this type of performance tradition. We do have some examples of people who would performatively dress in clothes associated with another gender. And they would do this specifically in spaces like house parties, at pageants, at balls, at bars and nightclubs that catered to queer people. Our examples mainly come from the Euro West and they mainly start around the 1800s. That doesn't mean this is where this originated. This is just the kind of records that we can find and talk about. And I do wanna give everybody just um, a quick heads up. So, these examples that I'm going to talk about are most often attributed to people who are desiring to publicly express same sex desires, rather than desiring to publicly express a particular gender identity. And what I mean by that is it was assumed that people were doing this because they were homosexual rather than trans. We actually don't know for sure. It's just what the records assume. And the records assume this because in the late 1800s, gender variance was very strongly associated with same-sex desires. So there were all of these theories that were emerging in the turn of the century, like the mannish woman that I talked about before or the gender invert that said, gender uh, variance is going hand in hand with same-sex uh, sexuality. And that kind of makes sense if you think about how gender and sexual identity are both based on social gender rules, right? Uh, it's it's seen as normal to live as the gender assigned to you. It's seen as normal to desire the opposite gender. So queer sexuality bends gender rules. So sometimes people would express their queer sexuality by bending gender rules, right? Um, and also our historical records just like don't have the words to capture the type of identity that we term trans today. In fact, until very recently, um, a lot of times trans women would just be called drag queens. So the words get really mixed up. Um, so the historical records are mainly talking about people with same sex desires and we just can't know what we can't know. So let's get into it. We have some records from the late 1800s and the early 1900s of what were called sapphic women, right? Sappho, sapphic women, women with same sex desires, dressing in masculine costume um, at parties or balls. So if you go to the lower right image, you have a group of women. They're going together in couples and in groups and some, some are dressing femininely and some are dressing 
um, masculinely. We also have examples of black women blues and jazz musicians like Gladys Bentley. She's over here on uh, the left. Um, and she would perform her numbers in menswear. And specifically she would do so because she was interested in attracting uh, women for romantic encounters. So she could have, she was performing blues and jazz, like she could have performed in whatever she wanted. She dressed in menswear specifically because she was saying, I am interested in women knowing that I am interested in other women. Oh, and we do have some etymology that we do know. I said we didn't know where drag came from, but we think we might know where the term drag queen comes from, and that comes from William Dorsey Swan. So when, uh, Swan was a former enslaved person, and in the late 1800s, he started hosting drag balls in Washington, in Washington D.C., and he's uh, recorded as having um, called himself the queen of drag. So we think this is where that term drag queen comes from. We don't know where drag comes from, but we think this might be where drag queen comes from, at least. So um, mostly the examples we have are from queer themed bars or clubs or parties, but sometimes these practices that were happening in these queer spaces moved outside of these designated spaces if they could be attached to cross-casting, right? That history of cross-casting. So on the left, I have a picture of some of the members of the Jewel Box Review. Um, the Jewel Box Review was a troupe that started, I think, in the 1930s or 1940s, and they advertised themselves as, quote, 25 men and one girl. And the 25 men were female impersonators or they were drag queens. And they did this very uh, glamorous feminine illusion. And you can see that in their pictures. This picture is actually taken from one of their programs that they would either distribute or sell at their um, performances. So they, they were doing a lot of this in like these queer themed nightclubs and bars, but they actually nationally toured their entire show in the 1950s and the 1960s. And the way they were able to tour to all these non-queer spaces is that they said they were doing cross-casting. And they said cross-casting was a quote, old mannish custom in the vein of Shakespeare. So basically they are saying, this is this tradition that doesn't have anything to do with queer culture. It has to do with the history of performance practices. On the right here, um, I have a, a picture of a USO show. Um, in the early 20th century, USO shows would use drafted gay men drag performers for women's roles. So like everybody got drafted. Um, some of these people who got drafted were performing female impersonations and drag queen performances in queer clubs. And when the uh, military would find out about this, they would move them into the USO shows and they would have them play women's parts because they were good at it, right? That's what they'd been doing as a career or as a hobby. And the army was like, the reason we're doing it is because there's no women to play these roles. So we have to put men in these roles. So again, it was that old timey cross casting excuse of what are you going to do? Like the show has to go on. So this is the only reason why we're doing it. So we do have some examples of these specifically practices that were emerging in queer cultural spaces moving out of these spaces, but most often the performances really grew and flourished in these queer spaces because they were seen in these spaces as something that queer people did to show and celebrate their queerness to others, right? That's why Gladys Bentley is wearing masculine outfits because she's like trying to attract women, right? And this is why we call these practices queer cultural practices. And we can see the legacy of that connection today with how drag is so tightly associated with gay and queer culture. So an early example some of you might know is The Birdcage. It was a play, but also it was a film with Robin Williams, right? And this is a story about two gay men. And we, are, we know that they're out gay men because they own a drag club, right? A more modern example that a lot of us are very familiar with is RuPaul's Drag Race. So RuPaul's Drag Race premiered in 2009 on the Logo Network. And the Logo Network was specifically a TV network that was designed for LGBTQ content. 
And previous to RuPaul's Drag Race, RuPaul had been doing some stuff, but one of the things he was super well known for was he um, was part of uh, the Mac Viva Glam campaign, like Mac Makeup. The, um, they did a 1994 Viva Glam campaign, and specifically the campaign was to fund and raise awareness for HIV and AIDS. So Drag Race, uh, RuPaul's Drag Race, now has 14 seasons under its belt, seven all-star seasons. It has franchises all across the globe. I actually started listing them all for this presentation, and then I was like, I'm just going to say they have franchises everywhere. They have a lot. Um, and they also have 24 Emmys. But there's no requirement that you have to be gay or even queer to be on the show. In fact, we just had a, uh, the recent season, season 14, they had a, a drag queen who was like pretty strongly ident identified as heterosexual and straight. Um, but even though there's no requirement that you have to be gay and non-gay people participate in drag, you can see that the show is clearly connected to queer culture. So down on the bottom left here, you see that these are some uh, drag race alums from across the globe, and they have been put into this kind of collage in this rainbow collage, right? Um, there's this very clear connection between drag and queerness. So the content, so we assume that the performers are queer and, and if they're not queer, we assume that, and the show assumes itself, that contestants are gonna be versed in queer references and culture. So that person who came in didn't have to be gay, but he definitely needed to know when they were referencing like Paris is burning and other types of like queer cultural touchstones. Um, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Drag Queen Story Hour, which um, started in 2015. Drag Queen Story Hour is a program where drag queens lead a children's story time, and they will do so in a local bookstore or they'll do so in a library. Um, and there's a dual purpose to Drag Queen Story Hour. The first is to encourage reading. Awesome. The second is to promote acceptance and appreciation of others. That's pretty broad, right? To just promote acceptance and appreciation. And this is done through several ways. One is having kids interact with a drag queen, but also it's done through the selection of books with themes about race or body, different families, ability, stuff like that. So the example um, I wanna talk about is the example on the bottom kind of center right. Um, uh, this is Mrs. Mrs. Kasha Davis, who's an alum of RuPaul's Drag Race, and throughout the pandemic, she did an online story time series, so if kids couldn't go to a local library and, and we couldn't, everything was shut down, they could uh, turn on YouTube or social media and she would do like a drag queen story hour. And she, she very carefully chose books that were aimed at issues or situations children might be experiencing, right? She was very careful with her book selection. So even though this program is really set around exposing children to diversity, difference, different ways of being, different uh, families, different cultural traditions, different issues they might be having, when we see coverage about Drag Queen Story Hour, it's mainly focusing on uh, it's mainly focusing on how the program is promoting acceptance and appreciation of LGBTQ diversity, and it's certainly doing that. But that's one of many things it's doing, right? And then the very last thing that I will mention is that some modern drag also use this performance, at, uh, this performance medium, as a way to aggressively confront norms. This is actually my most favorite type of drag. Um, a great example is the drag queen Divine, which some of you might be familiar with from um, many John Waters films, right? Um, Divine did this very unpretty anti-establishment type of drag. So this isn't like a female impersonation and it's not like a caricature. She's not like making fun of women, but she's really trying to like confront um, norms, right? Um, she's showing different ways of being. Um, and then very famously Divine became the template for Ursula from The Little Mermaid, which is even more confusing about what it means to have a gender, gender identity, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be uh, good or bad, right? So a lot of layers there. Um, and then I really like um, the horror drag contest show Dragula. I actually cannot watch horror, it terrifies me, but I'm super into like weird drag. So this is like a very beautiful example of drag that shows that drag can actually be anything you would imagine gender expression to be. So they have this like very iconic thing that they say on the show where they say like all drag is valid, like drag is art and all drag is valid, so your drag is valid. 
So just to wrap up the um, all of these thoughts that I, I know I've been speaking for almost 30 minutes, um, drag is publicly performing an aspect of identity that's different than your lived reality, or it's performing an identity in ways that mess with common identity assumptions. So it's really about playing with and doing different forms of identity. Drag can be done by everyone. And we actually have this long history of people who identified as heterosexual, who did drag for a variety of social and commercial reasons. Drag can also be done specifically as a queer cultural expression. And it has been done as a mark of queer visibility and pride for a long time. And then finally, drag is special and important because it's a form of art. It's a very beautiful form of art that specifically is intended to stretch our imaginations. So I know that's so much to process. There's a, a lot going on and I certainly can answer your questions, but what I would really like to hear, and I'll give you 30 seconds to just like digest this and think through it, but I would really like to hear if some of you heard or learned something that you didn't know before. So was there anything that you were not aware of um, that you learned uh, through this presentation? Is there something that you had heard about before um, that now makes like more sense or you have more context for and that's kind of exciting? And is there something that you heard and you want to know more about? So uh, I'm going to put uh, myself in teacher mode. I'm going to give 30 seconds and then um, you can turn on your mic. You can raise your hand. You can drop it in the chat or because we are being recorded, you can send me a private chat and I will read and answer it. So I'll give you a couple seconds um, to uh, get your thoughts in order. So I wonder if anybody wants to share um, something new they learned or some context they got that they didn't know before. We did get a comment saying terrific presentation. Um, Thank but, you. Yeah, if anyone has any comments, you can put it in the chat or uh, feel free to speak up. Heidi says, as a librarian, I'd like to hear a little more about the importance of drag queen story time. Yeah, I think it, I think it's a really important context that it was a movement that was started in San Francisco specifically to um, uh, educate children about uh, literacy and a lot of different types of issues or things they might be going through or different cultural traditions. And then also just expose them to different ways of being, you know, um, I think that um, activities like that really prepare people to be good global citizens because we are in this global society and we are like really interconnected on social media. And it's really hard to live in a space now where you don't interact with people except for people like yourself. So Drag Queen Story Hour just says, you know, sometimes people dress in outfits um, that you might not see every day or sometimes people live in a way that doesn't fit into boxes. Um, and it is good to just be accustomed to that and know it's out there and not have that be shocking. But in addition to just the embodied nature of the drag queen, I think it is really important that the selection of books is really about um, giving young people a, a exposure to an appreciation for diversity. And that's really gonna help them um, in, uh, their, in the rest of their lives. I think it's a really great program. Tracy says, besides RuPaul, what are other good drag queen shows or movies? So um, a lot of drag queens, and Liz and I were talking about this a little bit at the beginning before the presentation start, started. There's so many drag queens that have come out of RuPaul's Drag Race, and those drag queens have um, built their own presence. So um, there's a ton of social media and content 
Um, you can follow from some of those very popular drag queens that do unique stuff. So like Trixie Mattel is a very famous drag queen who came out of RuPaul's Drag Race. She has a makeup line, but she also has like this really cool YouTube series. Mrs. Kasha Davis has that drag queen story hour. Um, uh, Bob the Drag Queen uh, has a great podcast with Monet Exchange. It's I, yeah. I love Bob. Bob is great. So Sibling rivalry, and also Bob and uh, two other drag queens uh, do a show on HBO called We're Here, and I think it is absolutely fantastic. It really highlights the community aspect of drag. I would highly recommend that. Um, but also, there is this like drag adjacent genre called ballroom. Ballroom does drag, but it doesn't do the type of drag that you see on RuPaul's Drag Race. And it also involves other things. So ballroom is a performance genre for mainly black and brown uh, queer people in urban environments. And generally they are more low income. And this is where voguing comes from. Um, uh, you might be familiar with the Touchstone Paris is Burning, which was like this very famous documentary made about the ballroom scene, but there are ballroom um, shows now. So Pose is like a great example of ballroom legendary and HBO is a great example of ballroom. I also, I know you, you might not want the horror drag, trust me, I don't watch any horror, but Dragula is so interesting because it really shows drag diversity. So those are some of my recommendations. Tracy says, I noticed that on RuPaul, they refer to the contestants as she is that common. So Tracy, when a drag queen um, is in drag, it is generally best practices to refer to that person as she. Um, out of drag, it depends on what pronouns those people that, that person wants to use, but oftentimes the pronouns can be interchangeable. Um, out of drag, uh, the drag queen uh, Eureka likes they, them pronouns. You can call RuPaul she or he outside of drag when they're in, when a drag queen is in their drag, generally you use she pronouns to kind of respect the performance art. It's the same with drag kings. Um, and then all of the types of drag where you can't really identify the type of gender or identity that person is performing. Generally the pronouns can be interchangeable for, for the performance outside of the performance um, if performers um, uh, uh, are picky, they will, picky is a terrible word. If performers um, have a preference, they will um, generally uh, say it. Uh, Rose says, it's interesting that we can trace the origin of the term drag queen, but not drag. Do you have any sense of how far back in history the term drag has been used? Well, the um, Rose the Swan um, example where we have that record of him calling himself the queen of drag is like 1880s. And so drag has to be the term drag. I mean, he would have had to be familiar with it. So I would say somewhere in the 1800s, but um, my information and my archives are, are limited to like mainly the US or England. So I really don't know I, we don't know about the etymology of that term at all. We just don't. And there's lots of theories that you can find, but there is no um, uh, archival evidence we have that is like the nail in the coffin. Mojo asks, where are some drag shows near this area in New Hampshire, Liz? So um, if you're familiar with the Cinema Pub Chunkies, and this is actually, I think, a great example of how mainstream drag has become, uh, Chunkies usually does a Life's a Drag show once a month. They are doing it, uh, I believe, the 25th. I think, I'm pretty sure my friend and I got tickets for us to go. I hope they did. But they feature local um, drag artists. Um, there are some bars, I am forgetting them, in Manchester, that do it, but there is Manchester Pride coming up on the um, 18th. So that might be a place to go and learn about it. And Boston has a lot of stuff. Uh, there is the Boston Drag Gauntlet, which my friend just competed in. And again, didn't win, but was runner up. Um, and there is, if you utilize the uh, Twitch, there was the Serve Network. And last year when a lot of people, you know, vaccines weren't widely available yet, they did virtual drag shows. Um, if you pretty much just search in like drag near your plate, you're going to start to find some places, but mostly what you want to do is look for the cities. 
because that's where you're more than likely going to find uh, queer friendly venues. Um, but yeah, if you want to just a good place to get started and see some local talent, uh, Chunkies of all places is a good place to go. Liz, that's um, a great point. If you go to a pride function, there is going to be a table that is advertising drag troops and drag shows because that's how they're going to get people in. And because drag is seen as this queer cultural practice, you are going to find a drag performer at any pride you go to. Um, so pride is like a good uh, starting place, to like ask people or get flyers or hear information. A lot of drag, I, you know, my, my degrees are in theater, so I really like going to these theatrical spaces, but during the pandemic, a lot of drag performers learned how to transition a lot of their work online. So you can actually watch quite a few drag performances now um, on YouTube or other online forums. Um, and sometimes they have things set up where you can tip them on uh, places like Venmo and stuff. So I don't think it's as cool as going to a space, but some of us, I live in a very small isolated town too. So some of us don't have access to those spaces and um, we do have access to online forms of drag uh, performance. Tracy says, so is Tyler Perry in drag when playing Medea or is that just cross dressing? Tell me again, the difference please. So um, Tyler Perry is a man who is performing a woman caricature. So I would call that a female impersonation. Female impersonation uh, has a strong connection to cross-casting. So it depends on where you trace the origin of Medea. So um, if he came up with the caricature of Medea and then inserted it into um, his movies and his plays later, that's more female impersonation. If he wrote the character of Medea, and actually I think, I'm trying to remember my Tyler Perry lore, I think that he actually did write the character of Medea and then an actor like pulled out at the last second and then he wanted to play it. So it does have a history of um, cross-casting. Um, but either way, what he is doing is performing it as grotesque and for laughs. So he is not intending for us to lose sight of the fact that he is Tyler Perry. So it is more in the history of impersonation and cross-casting than the queer cultural practice of drag that we're more familiar with today. Yeah. I was about to say, it's actually a little similar to Divine. I'm a, actually a huge John Waters fan, huge Divine fan. And John has talked about Divine a number of times and he has said, like divine was uh divine didn't want to be a woman divine wanted to be a godzilla and he's yeah. like she yeah divine was not a he's like divine never saw or glenn milstead who was um divine's you know out of drag never saw himself as a drag queen for him divine was a character that he did and it would take on different roles depending on the movie but for him he never saw himself as a drag performer he just had one you know female persona and that was divine yeah and that was a real queer cultural practice because it was done among queer people kind of expressing this queer ethos so he's not mocking women he's not performing a woman character caricature he's not doing it just for a paycheck he's doing it because it's queer and it's weird and it's breaking boundaries well, and if you watch polyester he plays like a, a doug he, divine is not like he is in Pink Flamingos, he's like a Douglas Sirk heroine. Yep. <laughs> I'll let you get back to it before I go on about John Waters more. <laughs> so Rose says, I was really interested in the photo of Ethel Earl. By the way, I just wanna point out that Rose also have a PhD in theater. This is why these are like deep dive theater questions. Uh, I was really interested in the photo of Ethel Earl as the principal boy would have expected a more androgynous presentation, but it looked like the costume was emphasizing her adult feminine body. What's going on here? Okay, I'm gonna go back to the photo. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> okay, so where is our ethyl oil? Here we go. So, um, So the principal boy uh, genre was uh, popular in pantomime. We kind of see this sometimes in um, what was called burlesque. Burlesque was in the US and burlesque was in the UK, but kind of different. And so it was a 
an adult woman, the idea was that an adult woman matched the body of a young man better. So they would cast him in the principal boy. So that was kind of the excuse like, oh, they just fit these parts better. Like we can't have an adult man play this child character. But the second reason was because they would put these women in tights and people got to look at their uh, bodies outside of skirts. So the costumes, even though, and I, I don't like this picture, Rose, I don't like this picture either. There's not that many um, publicly circulating pictures of principal boys, but there are ones that look more like boyish, but they always kind of have this image of this long stocking leg and the tight waist. And that was because um, pantomime and uh, burlesque was getting their money by attracting all sorts of people including people who wanted to look at women's bodies. So it was a definitely a more risque or sexualized costume. And as that sort of going out of style um, in the late 1800s, um, uh, pantomime, this kind of sexy pantomime look transitions more into burlesque and burlesque is seen as a lot more body. And that's where we get our contemporary concept of burlesque as something that is something that shows women's bodies. Tracy says, what is your favorite drag queen movie minus Priscilla, Queen of the Desert? I mean, what I like about Priscilla is that it, again, has that kind of like grotesque drag where people are really messing with gender identity. And then also um, you see that these people are like very queer. They're part of a queer culture. So um, uh, I really like that too. You know, to be honest, I uh, my research mainly focuses on drag kings so I watch drag queens. I like drag queens. I like um, the different types of drag that they put out, but I'm more versed on drag kings. Um, my favorite drag king is this performer I used to watch when I was a graduate student. I would go down to, I was a drag, grad student at UC Santa Barbara, and I would go down to LA and I'd watch this drag king perform called Land Insider. Sorry, it's a very blue name. And um, he went on to uh, plays very well, let's just say, on one of the seasons of Dracula, And he really showed that um, drag kings could do this very like weird or glam or um, uh, imaginative form of drag as well. Were there other things that captured people's imaginations, made people think? Something you, you learned that you didn't know before? I actually didn't know that no one knows the the real origin of the term drag. Because when you look it up, there's a lot of these stories, but if you have to publish a book and everything has to be cited and you have to find the historical records, you will find that you cannot find it. Or maybe somebody who is more well-versed than me knows. I have not been able to find any real definitive hard records of the etymology of the term drag. Heather says, my brother and his husband had a drag pageant in Texas for a few years, and I generally appreciate the more in-depth understanding. Heather, I'm so into pageants as well. Uh, pageants and balls are similar to what you see on RuPaul's Drag Race, where it's not just performer performing a lip sync or a song or comedy, but there's some kind of competition built into it. And competitions are exciting. That's why people like uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. If you go see a drag performer, they're not always going to be in a competition. Sometimes they're just going to be in a show. But um, pageants and competitions are pretty fun too. Oh, Tracy, you're welcome. Thanks. I should also know that like, if you are a, um, a drag race fan, a lot of the alum are now touring. So if you wouldn't mind going to Boston or Portland or, cause I haven't seen too many of them making New Hampshire stops in, <laughs> you know, Keep, keep um, actually, no, a few of them might be coming to Portsmouth, but keep an eye out because you might see like, oh, they're on tour, maybe get tickets. Um, my partner and I went to go see Ben de la Creme for my birthday back in April. And what a fun show. Yep, Ben de la Creme and Trix, uh, Jinx Monsoon uh, tour, a tour, uh, like a holiday show. Um, uh, 
Trixie Mattel and Katya tour a show. Um, there is a um, resident show in Las Vegas. And I believe there's also a touring uh, show of the alums. Mm -hmm. So you can see them online, but, but there are opportunities to go see them in person as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bob and Monet are also touring. And I know that because I got tickets for them. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Monet is a hot commodity. She is currently on a season of Drag Race. Awesome, you got somebody who is interested in Chunkies. Yeah, um, it's a local one of those, you can eat food while watching a movie, but they also will do like comedy shows and stuff there. And I'm like, well, look at that. A cinema pub in New Hampshire has drag. Look at how far we've come. I, I will say if you ever want to go see a drag show in person, maybe some of you have and some of you haven't, it is customary to tip. So I would go take out 20 or 40 bucks in ones. And so for every song a performer does, it's customary to give them a dollar or two dollars um, just as a, a sign of appreciation for um, how hard they are working to entertain you. And also because the politics around uh, non-professional drag is that oftentimes they don't get paid by the venue. And so sometimes they are only getting like a cut at the door or they are getting those tips. So uh, make sure you bring those ones with you if you go to see a drag show in person. Thank you for that. Other thoughts? Uh, I did want to note that for dairy patrons, or if you're just a member of the G Milks Consortium, we do have uh, Meredith's book, Queering Drag, um, at the library. So if you would like to read it, you can put it on hold. It has a gorgeous cover. It does. But it is very academic. Uh, it has uh, the first chapter is like kind of academic theory, but then the second chapter talks about male impersonators and variety and vaudeville, our Vesta Tilly and our Annie Hindle that I talked about. The next uh, chapter talks about um, drag that was done as part of the Chicano civil rights movement, um, El Teatro Campesino. The third, the next chapter talks about that. Um, queer black drag, um, the Gladys Bentley type of drag. And then the final chapter talks about the current state of drag kinging. So um, you do get to see some of the different forms of drag that we don't get to see on RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh, thank you, Carol. All right, uh, any other questions or comments? And I saw someone giving applause. <laughs> Dairy Library host another drag story time. Um, That's a great question. I'd love to know about that too. Yeah, so, well, we were not originally the ones who were going to do it. That was the Taylor Library. And um, long story short, um, an official decided to make a hubbub um, and the Taylor Library canceled it due to backlash. However, once the rest of the town found out about that backlash, they rallied behind um, the performer and they hosted it at a um, a local music hall that we have here. And I believe like it was something 400 people came. So uh, it, it also is a, an example of like, well, if you didn't make a big deal, maybe 10 people would have come to this, but since you did now hundreds have, and they're all happy. Um, I don't know what dairy will do. Um, that's really not something I can say. I have often joked. I'm like, you could, I could just have my friend paint me up and I'll read to kids. And if people complain, I'm like, well, what's your problem? <laughs> or mm -hmm. my friend who's a drag king, I was like, well, it's a man dressed as a man. They can't get too mad. But real answer is we do not know. Um, we don't know if we will. Uh, I, I mean, there have been libraries that have hosted it and they have gotten like violent threats. And we do not want any of our presenters or performers to ever feel like their lives are in danger presenting. And also COVID is still happening. So those are the two big things. I think it's something very aspirational, right? Because the point is to expand people's um, access to forms of diversity. So always something good to keep in the back of your mind for things that can happen um, in the future. As somebody who also is uh, lives in a little town, I, I get the politics of, of uh, what resources and what you were able to get done in the small town. 
Well, if anyone wants to see a drag queen, I mean, you could just come up to the information desk and see me. I've really been working on my eye makeup. So I'm, 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 I am the library substitute. <laughs> oh, someone was sad about that. <laughs> no, happy, happy laughing. Oh, happy, okay. <laughs> I mean, I have joked that the way I do my makeup is like a drag queen in a hurry, so. <laughs> All right, another person says great presentation. So um, if no one has any more questions, then I will let everyone get on with their evening slash days. Yeah, I really appreciate everybody coming out to hear a little bit about the history of drag. It warms my heart and I hope that uh, it, you learn a little bit and it warmed your heart as well. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. All right, well, and everyone, um, Hopefully I can see some of you next week. Um, next Wednesday is Gardening in a Changing Climate or this coming Monday is uh, the Wachowskis. So if you wanna hear my friend and I talk at length about the matrix and Cloud Atlas and hear me defend Jupiter ascending, uh, you can find me this Monday at 6.30. <laughs> oh, thank sorry, you. A couple of thank yous. So and thumbs up. And I think that is a sign of a great program. So everyone, thank you for coming. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Take care. Bye.